So this is the part where we wrap everything up into a tidy bundle. That should be easy. Go ahead, Rick. <laughs> um, so we, we've, heard a, we've heard a lot uh, over the last uh, couple days, and um, we are going to try to use this time to see what additional, uh, additional pieces of it that we heard, the separate pieces, can be brought together further. Um, um, what we've heard so far is very interesting, I think has been very interesting and very valuable. Um, it is also very expansive. Um, and so we are going to be thinking about, we're going to have to be thinking about that as we go forward. I just want to start asking about, um, I mean, now that you've heard the, the discussions of all sort of three major parts, if there are any other points that sort of apply across all three parts. So we, we heard we heard the importance of getting really accurate sequencing and developing those capabilities and how that's clearly important for, for just about everything we've talked about in the long term today. Um, but I was wondering if there was anything else like that that has occurred now that you've listened to all three parts. And the other kind of question that I want to ask that's similar to that, um, I'd like to find what part, what, what among all these three parts are useful to bring together scientifically, or they might, they, there might be none that could cut across all three parts, but it, anything that suggests where the scientific interactions have to happen between these three, between the sort of functional, the clinical, and the discovery parts. Some are obvious between discovery and clinical, and some are obvious between maybe uh, discovery and function, but it's, is, is there anything else that ties across all three? So I'll just throw those out um, to start. And if I can just add to that, um, so the, the, the session here is to start to think of going from these strategic things that we've heard about to more tactical things. So uh, as you think about your answers, think about you know, what tactics you would use to implement some of these strategies. Eric, go ahead. So, so I'm struck that a thread that binds all three together, it's not a tactical comment, but the thread that binds all three together is variant discovery or gene discovery for a disease. Mm -hmm. That basically, that's a first step, then taking that to mechanism and taking that to the clinic to improve diagnostic rate. Again, I, if you're looking for threads that tie all three together in a very clear way in a you know, five second elevator speech, it just seems like discovery for health and disease is, is what drives this. And, and I, I also want to add that, that not, sorry, I, I've got you, Debbie, witness in a second. Um, add that also in bounds in this discussion are particular, that if you imagine that you had three general kinds of programs that did the kind, the, as we sort of do now, but maybe some modification of that or evolution of that, these are suggesting to us areas where might, we might have to build in interactions rather than having silos. So with that said, Debbie. So I think the technology also binds them together. I mean, really, uh, it came up a comparative, but putting the W back in the whole genome uh, is really important, okay? Uh, I think that thinking about how to do that, and Heidi should get the credit for that one, but uh, the, the moniker is true. I mean, I, I do think the technology binds them, and being able to dissect variation at different levels and how it gets implemented in diagnostics even, prenatal diagnostics is extremely important. And so I think that ties together across the whole, whole uh, uh, array of applications. And I think that's something that should always be in the mantra of genomics. That's the reason it started and as an institute. And Jeff, did you have your hand up before? Yeah, I don't want to, we should continue this part of the discussion, but I want to come back to this integration question. If people have really um, creative ideas about how we can most effectively integrate rather than just add another 15 con conference calls. Yep. And, and there was a hand up over here. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say another theme I think we've been hearing is longitudinal phenotype tracking among large numbers, if not every one of the people who are getting sequenced for clinical reasons, whether that's through a learning healthcare system or some other model, that I think that's a theme we've been hearing throughout the, the, the several days. Yeah, I, I just want to amplify that. I think that 
the, the longitudinal aspect of all that, it's like what Robert said earlier about some of the most important things out of Caesar won't even be, you know, haven't emerged yet, no pun intended. Um, so I think the longitudinal aspect's critical in, in all of this. Uh, data in integration is, of course, a perennial binding issue. We haven't spent almost any time talking about biocomputing, bioinformatics, and I'm confused as to whether we've transcended that as an item because it permeates everything, or if we've just forgotten about it for now. It's too hard. It, yeah, I, <laughs> as I said, it, needs its, it, it does need its own discussion, but it has come up uh, in key places, and I think also the, the data integration is part of that as well, unless you weren't including the data integration. Well, actually, maybe we can use that for Everybody. a second or two to talk about <laughs> tactics then. So, you know, what, what tactics should we be thinking about? The day, everybody talks about data integration, but when you think about all the different data types that we've got, you know, we've heard maybe uh, a dozen different functional assays that have been proposed by people, all of which the data is a different kind of beast. Uh, we've heard about lots of different uh, structural variation, which I think it's another topic because we haven't figured out yet how to measure all that structural variation. So what strategies or tactics do we have to integrate that? So you and I think your hands are up. <laughs> I don't, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, I think it's become so pervasive that we, we have stopped talking about it and that's why there, there are bioinformaticians here around the table. And I think that's a, that, on one level that's a good thing. I, I remind people that there's these very often, I describe this as there's these two sides of this. There's what I describe sometimes as blue collar, which is sort of making sure your data is straight, keeping it straight, keeping the metadata straight, making sure it flows correctly, making sure people can get access to it. That's very often quite engineering heavy, and there I really feel that we keep having the set point of the teams. I know this is like the fourth time I've said it, but God damn it. Um, uh, we, the size of the teams are, are, need to be in sizes of five engineers at a time or something like that, rather than one or two people. And then we have this much more sophisticated, what I just sometimes describe as white collar problem. And there I think it is, and that is both the things associated with this big data world and making sure that NHGRI really is exploiting, using and attracting the best people in this area is very, very important, I think, because I think there's a huge amount of problems that are sat on this side, and there is no magic bullet. There's no magic thing that says, oh, well, if you only pulled out this method, it would, it would, it would work. And so the most important thing, I think, is to keep, is to invest and fund in both of these areas correctly. And then NHGRI has a headache about coordinating with BD2K, with other ICs, uh, with medical informatics. I, I don't think it should be a headache to coordinate with, with BD2K. I mean, we, that's a, we should relish that as an opportunity. Uh, and, and it gives us a much uh, better leverage. The thing about bioinformaticians is they're capable of, of building things that immediately apply across the institutes at NIH. And it's frustrating to have them to be uh, things being replicated in different institutes in an inconsistent way. So I would strongly encourage that. And, 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 and I would also uh, exhort everyone to make, to, to, to remind themselves that uh, this certain, the white, white collar uh, bioinformatics, as you <laughs> describes it, Can we not is call a it research. white collar? Yeah, I'm let's sorry. not call yeah. it that. But, but <laughs> bioinformatics at that level. It's kind of a weird, I don't know if bio, it, and bioinformaticians are part of the proletariat or the yeah, bourgeoisie, right, okay, yeah, but yeah. I would probably just kind of. Okay, rejected your, uh, your analogy, but um, uh, the, the deepest form of bioinformatics is a research enterprise, and it has to be supported as a research enterprise. So Lucilla and then David? Yeah, I think specific uh, incentives for data integration should be built in uh, in the form of RFAs or, or, or something like that, because you can't expect necessarily different groups to spontaneously integrate or, or the data to integrate without um, specifically incentivizing that portion. So uh, this is an area where I worry that we really have the wrong picture in our head. Um, I think it's good that it's been raised. I agree with uh, you and, and, uh, and this is what I mean. Um, first of all, what we need in, in some cases 
is not new methods and technologies, but we have sort of an organizational problem, okay, which is that uh, we don't invest in interoperability. We, all, the, we know the white collar, if you want to, whatever, the high level bioinformatics tools are all non compatible. Very few, you know, some tools get used a lot, but most people write their own. There's really no infrastructure or platform or whatever that, that the field relies upon. Even things that have been successful, like file formats. I often hear people say, well, we have BAM, we have VCF. I mean, the history of that, as probably people know, was there were no file formats. So at the Thousand Genomes Project, Cold Spring Harbor, we sat people in a room and said, you have to come up with a file format. And then there was no governance of it or evolution because it didn't belong to anyone or anything. Um, that's now taken on by the Global Alliance Data Working Group, you know, to, to move that forward. But we have a problem, which is the picture in our head is often to do projects, to people write a, a program, and then we're surprised when it's not interoperable. And the solution is not a monolithic approach. It's not to have the big database in the sky or to force everything together, but we do need to change how we do it. And the last point I'd make, focusing more again on how do we, have, how do we learn from other areas where it's a virtuous cycle, it's not how we work, how they work. The other point I'd make is BD2K, at least to date, I think with Phil Bourne and maybe it will change, does not see itself as, as I understand it, in fixing this organizational problem or taking on some of the tasks that we talk about. It, at least to date, maybe it will change, has been focused on fundamental data science. Okay, and that might be a great, Eric Green, who ran it up until now, is nodding his head yes. Okay, but so I worry a lot that the problems we're talking about are not generally problems of fundamental data science. And then everyone goes, oh, BD2K will take care of that. I think it's highly unlikely as currently configured. Maybe Phil will change it because he's a great guy and he's starting. But I just worry that in the discussion, everyone goes, yeah, it's going to be BD2K is going to take care of that. And there's no plans for BD2K to take care of that. So no one's going to. So, so what strategy can NHGRI NSF. do to try to yeah. engage and, and fix that problem? And NSF won't take care of it either. Just add. So, I mean, some of the things, David may want to comment and others, is again, trying to figure out what, what limits people doing these things. Okay, some of it's incentives, but the incentives can be created by, you know, as people said, grant, grants requiring people to share. We see with dbGaP, for example, that people are required to share, but for a lot of architectural and regulatory and other reasons, it doesn't actually flow all that smoothly. So one thing, I don't want to be a broken record on this or suggest it's the only approach, but trying to work on shared APIs, try and use what the, what, what the people use in other fields of processes to develop open APIs to let people iterate them, to try and parse the problem so people can write tools that are interoperable and plug and play, et cetera. David might want to comment more, but there are some things and they are being worked on. The question of what can any share I do? Well, it could support some of those things. It could encourage through its grantees to actually use such systems in some ways or measure whether or not data is flowing as opposed to just say, did you, did you check a box? You know, I, I, I don't want to make up on the fly what NHGRI can do, but it, it's not going to be start with a new monolithic approach. It's going to have to be figuring out that strategy. Sort of a meaningful use for uh, genomic data? I, you know, I think that this was what the meaningful use standards were supposed to do and didn't do. So we actually need to look to other industries or other places because the whole point was APIs were supposed to be wrapped around this part of the meaningful use standards and it didn't happen. The doing deep bioinformatics in the context of one of the truly great challenges that we have discussed at this meeting is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, that's really, it, we, you know, you have to embrace the bioinformaticists as a key part of the team, fund them appropriately to get their part of that done, and let them be a, a, a real team member with these great challenges. It's a simultaneously working out the new, the new theory and the deep kinds of things that they would actually get credit for if they were in a computer science department. You got to do that, but doing that in the context of a, of, a, of a grand challenge problem that the NHGRI has, has identified so that you're developing the APIs and then you're working on deployed implementations of them at the same time so they're proven in the field and we're actually making great scientific progress with them. That's a, that's a huge opportunity. So we, we just need to bring them into that, give them, give them the opportunity. Just, I mean, I want to echo what David says, but just to also say that, you know, the APIs are, you know, necessary, but nowhere near sufficient, you know, start on this, right? Because 
if you, if you think about you know how Facebook or Twitter or Google work, right? It, it's an incredibly um, well orchestrated and designed and 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 you know built set of systems uh, in order for you to have the sort of functionality that you have in those those uh, in those settings, right? And and the set of problems that we're trying to challenge, but, you know. I think this is the wrong analogy, though. I actually think the analogy is we're trying to create the internet. So I, I think that, that, no, no, I'm actually totally serious. I think this is actually one of the huge problems we have as a field, is that we think that what we're doing is creating things that sit on top of an internet. Internet allows data to flow, OK? And then once data flows, people can add layers on top of it of increasing value. And right now, data doesn't flow. Data is isolated and siloed. Right, so I think the reason why Facebook isn't a good analogy is Facebook is a big closed system there. Right. That's not what we're talking about. I think it's a question of wrapping metadata tags around pieces of data. And what's true about those sorts of things, XML type implementations, is they're extensible. They tend to be things that can be started lightly and grown and grown. I do think it would be worth getting sets of people from the tech industry in. But you know, I, Craig Mundy at Microsoft talks an awful lot about this, about ways that you build a system that start light and grow rather than a Facebook kind of thing. And, and I mean, there are a few of us in this room, myself is not one of them, who are deeply experienced. David Hausler knows a lot about these things. But I think the NHGRI could benefit from finding a handful of distributed tech advisors who do this routinely and have them come and look at what we're doing and say, yeah, we were in this position for certain things and we got out of it this way. My point about the meaningful use standards for the, the Office of the National Coordinator for Healthcare Information Technology was there was a recommendation to do precisely this and it wasn't done and there were a set of people who tried to push them to do it. We could get them in and help us because there's an evolutionary path. It doesn't have to be perfect at all. It's quite incremental, but it would help. But I I'm not disagreeing with yep. you, but it, you know, in order to, you know, to do the large scale analysis, people are going to want to build you know, bigger systems in order to put that you know, and, together. The, you know, and, I, I, and, and that's not going to, you know, so, so the extraction of meaning from the data isn't going to come from the API. No, no, right? no, no, I mean, no, no but the, like what the, comes from the API the is standards. the ability for third parties, you know, the graduate student here, the postdoc there to write a great piece of code that plugs in and it unleashes great creativity because there's APIs. Okay, Carol? That's all. So I think one of the biggest challenges to integration is not data formats or APIs, but going back to the semantics of what we're talking about. So phenotypes, defining phenotypes in a way that the data you share is meaningful. You put a bunch of clinicians in a room and you ask them to define what schizophrenia is, you're going to get about a thousand different sort of descriptions about, so how do you integrate data on schizophrenia when the phenotype definitions being used to collect the data in the first place are so divergent. So I think semantics and metadata tags, as Eric said, I think that's really, really critical to data integration. That's one. And then the other thing is, how do we represent uncertainty about the data that we're generating so that it can be computed on? I think that's another critical issue that we really haven't addressed. And this is a and great topic. We have a few more, but we, let's take two questions and then move on to another yeah. area. So go ahead. I just want to sort of second a little bit what Carlos was saying. Um, I mean, you can sort of ask what comes first, the API or the standards, or then, then tackling the question and the research, or do you start to think about the question and the research and then think about the type of interfaces and APIs you need? And I would argue the latter. I mean, I think you fundamentally, to integrate the data and put it together and to get good people to work on it, you really have to have you know, clear research questions, people really thinking about interesting problems. And then they'll build all the interfaces. But I think you need that to motivate things. Yeah, but isn't that, isn't that what we've been doing for the last 25 years? Yeah, but no, no, I'm serious. So I actually mean that in all seriousness. Like, at least for myself, I so feel like... I, I, I just think here we're going through the same growing pain. It's been very revealing to me the conversations we've had with the CERN data group, which has grown up over the years around the LHC. And what's interesting is that they went through a period where the data stuff inside of CERN was sort of hidden inside of their projects, and they didn't externalize it, and they didn't think about it deeply. And it was only in the 90s where they really sort of said, wait a second, we've really got to treat the data stuff as a separate part. And they made it, I mean, it's in a very certain way. We don't have to copy it. But what they went through socially, I think, is what we are going through at this moment by saying, we need 
a data infrastructure, which is data APIs and backends and all of this stuff, that allows us to do good science on top of it. In the set, and they viewed it in very much in the same way as they talked about the, the ring as being a piece of infrastructure for physics in which you do great, clever physics. But the making of the ring is an engineering and, and I think, and I... Oh, and so, so I just want to say that when we're, when we're drawing, I mean, I just think we're, we're growing up as a data science. This is part of our growing pains. There is stuff that we should carry forward from the, what we've done. So for example, data openness, compared to many other sciences, we are naturally open in a way that many other sciences aren't, including high energy physics, for example. So that's a good thing to take from our history. But there's some other things where we just gotta, we just gotta leave it behind. Like our own kooky file formats, we've just gotta right. leave it behind. Right. Uh, and uh, you, you know, so there's, a, there's, there's not a, a revolution or an evolution, we've just got to um, uh, mature as a as a as right. a data science, and, and, and in particular, you know, as you, I agree entirely with you, and, and I agree also what you said about the engineering teams can't be you know three to five people because we've tried that, and what you do is you end up with lots of things that don't connect. I do think it's very informative, and if NHRI hasn't done it, they should. Some of us have done it in other settings. Talk to a bunch of people who do work in tech or who have tried to get into genomics, and because they all have looked at it, they think it's an analogy. They just are perplexed and dumbfounded at how we do things. The utter absence of any standardized interfaces or any group that comes together and tries does that. Like when we set up the Global Alliance, not to keep doing this, I can tell you what the Googles and Amazons and all these people said was, oh, now we might consider working in this field. One of the things that has stopped us in our tracks is that you could talk to 10 different people and hear 14 different things about how you should do it, and that makes it a market failure. Okay, now whether NHRI can play an important role is it can't do it alone. But for example, even just aligning that it will support things, and also one of the things that they tell us about standards is you can't have 16 sets of them. And one of the things about our community is whenever you talk about this, someone goes, yeah, I'm doing it, and someone else says, we should have a meeting to talk about how to do it, because I'm not doing it. And the problem is if you have many different sets of standards, then no one can, from the outside, build anything and have the hope that it will be a market. Because in the absence of something to plug into, if every wall has a different plug, no one can sell a toaster. All right, and so NHGRI could line, that's what we're talking about, guys. We're, we're talking about, like, no one can sell anything and build anything because it doesn't plug into anything else. And so NHGRI could line up behind those things, try and line up BD2K behind them, not pick the winners, but set conditions on which there can be a virtuous evolution of a market, you know, based on what actually works. So I think this has been a great discussion, but there are a few other sort of common themes that maybe we should move on to, but, um, let, one of the other common themes that I think we heard that crossed all three boundaries was this whole issue of we don't know how to yet capture all the kinds of genetic variation that exists in genomes. So, you know, we heard about today the idea of a telomere to telomere um, sequence. Uh, we heard about how to think about doing that across evolutionary space so that we understand a little bit more about what's conserved and what's not conserved. So thinking about that, what strategy or what tactics should NHGR be thinking about to help advance that project of uh, being able to capture all kinds of variation in, the geno in genomes? Well, I was just going to say, to me, that's a critical piece that goes across everything we've talked about. And one could certainly imagine taking the Mendelian project, for example, and taking the families that really look the most Mendelian, at, but for which no, no alteration's been found, and to do these absolute platinum genomes on those families once we do them on normals and know what's missing. Um, because I think we, you know, in the commercial space, people, and the clinical lab space, we compete on who's got the best coverage. And, but what are we covering, right? We don't even know what, what, what genomic regions we're not even sequencing. So I, I just think having incredibly, um, well, back to the whole, the, you know, the W and whole genome, that really informs the Mendelian project, it informs the Caesar projects, it, it cuts across all of them. Yeah, I can just say uh, from the Thousand Genome Structural Variation Group, um, one of the things we're finding is we do need to encourage 
input of uh, a lot of different technologies together uh, and integrating that data properly. Um, and so anything we can do to encourage that uh, from NHR would be great. So what would that be, though? Well, so in our case, it's, for example, incorporating data from PAC bio reads, um, um, in integrating optical analyses data, for example, um, PCR-free DNA libraries, et cetera, and then coupling that with a huge amount of validation uh, using orthogonal approaches as well. And we're doing this in actually in a U41 setting, just as an FYI. So it's very, uh, it, it's working in a very concerted effort. So right. I want, I want to, I'm sorry, Debbie. I, I want to pick up on something you said because I always, I always think about the balance of what can be done in a standalone technology development program or center or grant and what really benefits from being having you know, integrated different data types in more of a center that can do a bunch of things but may not focus on uh, any particular tech development. So, so where's the, you know, where's the right, how, what's the right way to balance that or to handle that? Do you, do you absolutely need both or is it? Yeah, I, I, def I mean, personally, I think you do need both. Uh, you need to encourage the development of the new technologies, and then when those become available, to try to integrate that as, and test them robustly as, as uh, in the larger scale so, so, projects. So I guess a, another part of that question is, so, so we're not looking at, in the next four or five years, predictably, a magic bullet technology that's going to do the end-to-end -end chromosomal sequencing. Nobody really has faith that that's going to happen, and to the well, extent I'm you need it. I mean, maybe add a, a little bit of perspective, I guess, on this. We have spent quite a bit of time with the PacBio as one platform. And certainly, there are regions of the genome that we still can't assemble with PacBio technology. We've looked at this specifically. We know where those regions are. But the regions that we can access and assemble in a routine fashion, as opposed to a targeted, you know, mom and pop operation where we go after each of the difficult regions, has really diminished significantly. And I'm actually quite excited by the potential, not just for PAP Bio, for any of these long read technologies. It's something yeah. that we brought up over and over again over the last 10 years. The importance of long reads in terms of comprehensively accessing genetic variation still remains really high. But I think if we had an increase from, let's say, 30 kilobase reads to 50 or 100 kilobase reads, we really could be talking about, I mean, I think we're at a trans transformational position right now in terms of de novo assembly, but it would be another catapult that where NHGRI could really invest in really advancing and helping advance tech sequencing technologies to get us to that next level. I don't think we're 10 years away. I don't even think we're five years away. It, the technology exists now yeah. to increase by two orders of magnitude the N50 contig line. Right. Uh, we could get the gold genome right. within three to five years, and right. we that I do that. But I understood you were asking for the platinum right. genome. And well, the platinum I was wondering genome about the difference between a, the gold and, and Evan's 90% of Evan made of a distinction missing. here. Evan made a good distinction, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, the gold genome is going to be good enough without every base of every centromere to do a lot of stuff, and we need to go after that aggressively, and we can get it in three to five years. And, and the gold genome 10, gets, 10, how, gets how many, what percentage of your remaining insertions that you're worried about? All. Gets all. Gets all. <laughs> so what it gets, it gets all the euchromatic variants, without, with, with irrespective of whether they're inversions, insertions, deletions, irrespective of size or complexity. That's so you've gold. Been trying to get it over if here. Evan's happy with it, we'll all be happy. <laughs> Jake? So, so, I mean, I, <laughs> Telomere to telomere is, I mean, that's a technology goal, and that will take some time. But, you know, you, you said three to five years for a gold genome. You know, it, it, like kind of was alluded to earlier this morning, with PacBio, I think it's reasonable to do a gold genome now. Um, and it's more expensive than an Illumina genome, but it's not, it's, it's not intractable. We're talking about $10,000. Um, well, let's, yeah, let's even say it's $50,000. But I, I think, you know, there's a, there's a, I, I don't think this paper's come up today yet, but a recent paper from Han Brunner and, Joris Veltman, I think, in, in Nature kind of illustrates how much we're missing in exomes when we, that we, I don't think we had a real appreciation for until you sequence the genome and you see how much you're actually missing. And I don't think we have an appreciation now, quantitatively, for how much we're missing even in the genomes that we sequence. And, and you know, doing 50 or 100 pack bio genomes would, would go a long way towards uh, serving that goal and not waiting three years to do it, but just, just going ahead and, and finding out what happens. Uh, and that's something we could do tomorrow, right? And it would, serve the, it would also serve the goal of supporting a second technology 
um, other than Illumina? Yeah, I, I think this is a good thing to shoot at. I think it's a good thing to use program announcements for, that rather than huge efforts to do it, there's a lot of creative ideas out there. PacBio is a good one. Maybe there are a bunch of other ones too. But right now at study sections, uh, new assembly programs don't get reviewed well because there is a sense on the part of reviewers that, well, it's a solved problem or kind of a boring problem. Or filling in some of this stuff is, is kind of not so interesting. I think if you merely had a program announcement, you'd begin to get some R01s, maybe not to do 50, but give me 10 good genomes like that, which at these prices you could do. I think there's a lot of creativity. High C to, to be able to jump over things, other kinds of, of interesting long range technologies. And it'd be good to get a bunch of creativity. What I wouldn't want to see is a you know, single monolithic large project to get 10 or 20 or 50 yeah gold standard genomes. What we actually need is a way to really be able to turn the crank and make them. And I think there, a program announcement that signals to study sections, fund some of this stuff, could be a good thing. So just to say, and um, you know, Oxford Nanopore is, is the other technology here. And th for a long time, they've not seen a, a change in signal as the, as the read length goes through. And it really does look like it's limited by sample prep. So the interesting problem, there's a problem, or well, there's things about tuning up the chemistry and the readout system, but in fact some of these challenges are going to be about the upfront process of sample prep and delivery to the pore rather than the actual process of, of reading it. So that telomere to telomere view might not be quite so crazy, actually, um, if you can get the sample prep sorted out in a, in a five-year time scale, which is kind of awesome, actually. I mean, I, th I think this, this, this discussion is a really important one, and, and I agree, it's not just PacBio, and it's not an either or, it's not like we wouldn't do Illumina or we use other technologies. But I, I think one thing that has been touched on a couple of times is what's the best way to do this. And my sense is that there's still a great advantage to having the large scale genome centers be involved in these activities, largely because they've been involved in a lot of large scale sequencing. These are to generate, for example, you know, uh, 250 flow cells of data from, uh, or smart cells from a pack bio does take some time, it takes months, and it, there's processing involved, there's management, there's annotation of sequences, all, there's algorithm developments, there's software developments. And I think, you know, in terms of the, a mechanism for this, if we're going to proceed in this direction, is to involve maybe small groups of individuals in conjunction with large scale genome centers to really pull this off. Because we do need still muscle. It's not as if this fits perfectly with the, the seven characteristics, Adam, that you mentioned in the beginning, you know, in terms of scale and consortia and so on. But there's like a really, it shouldn't be too big, and it, and it should be kind of a pilot in some respects, but at the same time, you want to involve enough muscle and enough expertise to get the job done. So uh, this is something that came up in the comparative genomics and evolution breakout, this whole concept of organizing this around, uh, I don't know, an ENCODE type consortium where you have technology development, which is aimed at this 10K de novo genome, where you have analytical <laughs> development, which is about assembly, alignment, algorithms, uh, you know, uh, element discovery, and we, where you also have production of, let's do a bunch of uh, seeds for, you know, for all of these programs to work on. And these seeds can be a bunch of different species, a bunch of different populations, a bunch of different individuals, which can be uh, serving as gold standard references. So when you, when you put all that together as a vision, I think you will get buy-in from both the technologists and the computational folks, as well as the sort of reference both species and populations. Just a little point there, if we add, if we keep the data producers being the genome centers, we have the Bermuda standards, which means the data get out there, they get out there and they become accessible immediately, which will then create a whole proliferation of new algorithm development and software development. I think there's a real benefit to not having that be localized to a group, but to be distributed. Oh, absolutely. In terms of data, yeah, yeah. In terms of running the project, So the quality is there, yeah. David? 
This is uh, an important issue for the Mendel projects as well. I, I think uh, there's nothing more frustrating to have all of the family reagents in hand and still not solve, solve the family. And uh, so we're always wondering whether it's somewhere in, in regions that we ha can't access. And uh, I would also urge, Evan mentioned this morning, that it would be great to have this kind of resource for at least 50 different individuals from around the world, because we get samples from, as, as the point was made earlier, from all over the world. So having this kind of gold or platinum genome from a lot of different populations, uh, at least one representative of a lot of different populations would be quite helpful, I think. So can, can I transition slightly, but build on a point that was just made? So I'm, I'm going to refer to what I'll call the Bustamante matrix, uh, which we saw this morning. So um, what is the right balance? Uh, you know, this raises the whole question of what's the right balance versus a large scale project versus uh, U54 slash U01 type metric versus an R01. And so getting the right balance of passionate PIs whose necks are on the line uh, versus the cost efficiency and production standards of a large scale center and then the probably somewhat in between of the U54s and U01s. What's the right way to think, what's the right balance of the portfolio for, again, thinking about strategy, or I'm sorry, tactics going forward. Uh, Adam, you said you thought it was about uh, 30, 25 to 30% RO1s what's right our, now? What's our RO1? What? Yeah. 10 to 15%. 10 to 15%. Well, so what, and then factor into that the use of program announcements that can actually guide the direction. So what are people's thoughts about what the right balance of that is? <coughs> Conversation killer. So, so I, I think on a meta level that the NHGRI has actually been doing this experiment for the last decade or more to try to figure out how to do science at scale by mixing these various types of things, the large-scale consortium projects, the directed projects, the R01s. And given the outputs of NHGRI-funded science, I think the experiments have been arguably largely successful. Uh, but that doesn't mean that what has been done in the past should guide what's done in the future. So I, I think probably there's no direct answer to the question that you asked as to what the right balance here is. But the, the way forward is to be responsive and to probably keep experimenting between large projects, R01s, and as Ewan described earlier, you know, know when or, or at least be comfortable making a bet to take something into a large scale uh, sort of consortium project as it gets to the tipping point so it can be pushed into that. And obviously there, it won't be perfect, but I think it's something to keep experimenting and, and something that NHGRI has been good at experimenting with and getting good outcomes over time. At the risk of uh, being accused of putting the shoe on the other foot, uh, I, I agree with a comment that was just made, but as a follow-on to that, one has to measure the outcome. And I'm wondering, does NHGRI track this, uh, this, uh, these experiments in a way saying, you know, if I add 20% of this or 30% of that, what do, I, what do I tend to get out over the next few years? Yeah, no. What's the metric? Yeah, it's yeah. really hard to measure. You have to, it's a hard metric, but um, you know, uh, right. having been on the other side of that equation, I've been asked to come up with metrics. And, and, and so it's so context dependent. I can think of a number of times when we've had um, R01s that came in and were really stretching the boundaries of, an, of what an R01 was and actually ended up being a, a U grant later on because th that's, that was most appropriate for that scale of effort. So, so something that, that hasn't been touched on and, and that NHGRI has done very well and I want to make sure it gets mentioned is NHGRI has provided strong project support in the form of very strong program officers who 
often could steer and support a project without necessarily controlling the funds. And so, for example, like the Thousand Genomes Project, which has been a, a, a you know a coalition of the willing with like as far I mean really like almost no dedicated funding, not really a strong governance model, and yet if you ask why did that project succeed, there was a coalition of funders who did support individual activities, but then there was Lisa Brooks and her team and the team she worked with who really were glue that held that project together. And I've worked with many institutes and. Like you can have the, a mechanism that's supposedly a very collaborative mechanism, but where the inmates, you know, the sort of the, the animals in the cage are clawing at each other and no zookeeper is actually having them, you know, <laughs> go in the same direction, even though the mechanism would suggest they're all going to work together. And then I've seen others where no one knows where the funding's coming from, and yet everybody works together really well. And that's a testament to good project leadership. And I think that's something in my experience that NA NHGRI, all, no offense to any of the other institutes around the table, NHGRI does better than anyone. And so what is the action item? Like value, support, and recruit and retain, you know, people who, no, who are really strong, you know, program officers who don't try and control and dictate, but do actually add value. And you've done that well, and you should keep Thank doing you. it. So, so I always wanted to be a zookeeper when I was, when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> And I'm so, not you are, yeah. <laughs> which <laughs> which <laughs> animal? Which a animal, Adam? Um, I won't I won't say which animal. So, um, I I agree with you, David. And actually, actually, it is, although it's not an overt consideration. Um, my colleagues and I talk about it from time to time about models that scale to that to allow that. I will also add that although sometimes we we love to take credit for anything good that happens, that in fact a lot of a lot of the amount of management things need, and amount of people time things need, very much depends on the, on the individuals who are involved, and also on the institute's expectations of the institutes that may be uh, substantive partners in it. And I think th those variables are actually larger than what you, you said, but both are really important, so thank you. Debbie. I want to change topics, Ian. Is that okay? Education, it hasn't come up. I have to have to bring up education. And we have to train more people in, in genomics. We need to continue that trend. We probably need to double what we're doing in education in genomics as it takes mainstream. And I don't see us going there. I also think we need to change uh, the people at the table. I see lots of gray here. I want to see lots of young in the future, right? More young. It's younger than it was the last time we all met. I have to say that. I'm very happy. But, but uh, I want to see more young people at the table, too. So I'll just start it there. Education is really important. And uh, I know Genome has always been interested and supportive of it, but I think we have to be even more supportive in these climate. What, so what's the strategy to fix it? Uh, I mean, we need to increase training at all levels. I mean, uh, we're, not, we're not, we don't have enough training grants. We don't have enough slots on training grants. We don't have enough anything on training grants. We're not diversifying as much as we should be on training grants. Where do we need to go to do that? I don't know, but we try. I mean, genomics tries harder than, and than I think most groups do. But we cannot give up, and, and we have to move forward and, and improve this. Uh, I always jump on this bandwagon when it gets brought up because I think it's incredibly important. And at most of our training programs today focus on bringing physicians into science and funding their research. But um, the reverse of that, I get, you know, I've run a training program in clinical molecular genetics to bring people to do clinical genomics for the last seven years. I now have applications. I got 65 for one slot last cycle. And these are incredibly talented, largely PhDs, interested in moving into the clinical translational space. And there's no, they're, they're all excited, young, energetic, and I can take one or two of them. And this is the same with the other, you know, handful of programs across the US. So, and, the, and all the programs complain because there is no source of funding for the PhD training in the clinical space, the reverse of it. So I think this is incredibly important, you know, opportunity to harness the young, you know, PhDs that could move into the space if we do something right. 
So, so it, it, I'll get uh, David and then uh, Jim, but um, you know, one of the things this flies in the face of has been a lot of fairly high profile papers in the last year or so that have talked about the fact that you know, maybe we're training too many people. And it may not be, we're training too many people in the area of genomics, but we're training too many people in the area of life sciences. So I, I just think as we think about that, we've got to think about this as an environment where this issue has been raised, I think, at the fairly highest of levels of our sort of scientific community. So, David. Um, yeah, I would, I would also uh, like to mention uh, medical students. We, we've had a lot of disparaging remarks in the last two days about what, how physicians can use, what they are able to interpret out of these data that we're generating. And um, going forward, we have to have a much more sophisticated physician user base, I would argue. And if NHGRI could provide, um, uh, I don't know, modules of uh, information related to clinical genomics that could be used or co-opted by medical s schools to educate their students, I think that would be um, highly desirable. We'd get over, over it's like making a, an investment for a long time. So I just want to amplify what Heidi and Debbie said. And I th it's not just, you know, altruism. The, 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 the presence of trainees and having a critical mass of trainees really um, vitalizes programs and I think, I think um, propels success and, and, and tackling new things. So I, I, I agree that as far as bang for the buck um, in, in propelling progress, that's probably a really, really good one. Mike? And I'd just like to respond to Rex's comment. Yes, this comment is always made, are we training too many people? In genomics, we are not training too many people, and particularly on the quantitative computational side, these guys have lots and lots of job options. Many of them don't do postdocs. I mean, there is a huge demand for this area. It is increasing, and it's not decreasing. And if we look at what data is going to be coming up over the next period of time, who's going to be analyzing these data? Who's going to be interpreting and helping us go forward if we're not training enough people? And we're not, absolutely not, in the quantitative sciences. I, I want to add my voice to that chorus and also raise a concern about the current move afoot on training grants, which is to use them as uh, mechanisms that are distributed across as many institutions as possible, right? So there's this sort of discussion about breaking up training grants into, you know, smaller and smaller slots. And this is certainly what you've heard at, you know, at NIGMS. And I, I just think it's incredibly bad thinking. You know, the, the places that are most successful in producing research should be the places that are doing the, it should be sort of proportional to the training, right? Or, or the places should come up with training programs that, you know, are, that, that, that have the right kind of argument for it. And, and I don't think that that view is, is going to produce the best set of trainees nationally. That's my, you know. Mike? Here, here. Sorry, one, one other comment, and I'm and, and strongly agreeing with, with Carlos. I've, I, I, my wife has had training grants with four and six people, and, and ours is not huge at Michigan in, in genome science. It's now 13, it's been 10, uh, sorry, eight. Um, with eight to 10 to 13, you can start to build a critical mass with four or six or eight four or six, it, there's just, just no way you can do anything interdisciplinary and have any kind of critical mass of people. We can't get too small. We can't get too spread out. We need our programs to be big enough that these students are interacting not just with a strong faculty, but a diverse set of, of, of fellow trainees across a range of disciplines. It's incredibly important. So, so what is the impediment for increasing the, amount, the number of trainees, I mean, in training grant slots? I mean, in terms of the numbers, money. It's always the, money. The, the dollars, it's not huge amounts of money in the grand scheme of things. And I, I'm actually I'm appalled by this, largely because this is the first time in my life I've been asked to take on a training grant, and at the same time I've been asked to reduce the number of slots by half over a five-year window, which I think is unfair because we produce, and others do, great trainees and there's a demand for them. So I don't understand why this is such an issue and why NHGRI, if they've been good, couldn't be better in this regard. It should be better. Having taken on some of Eichler's trainees, I'd like to vouch for him. I think he, he, does, he does produce some very good trainees. So I, I think we, we've had a really good discussion on a variety of areas. There actually are probably a few more that we could have, but we're running out of time. So are there sort of any last minute burning 
issues that anyone would like to get on the table. Okay, great. Thank you. Eric, I think you're up. 